Hello. We're going to start in just a few minutes. I'm going to make you all co-host so you can unmute yourselves. Alyssa and AJ, nice to see you again. How are you? Hey, how you doing? Good. Good. How are you? Ah, hanging in there. Not bad for a Friday afternoon. <laughs> hmm. Ralph. Be right back. Welcome, everybody. Hey, Ralph. Hey, Hans, how are you? Good. For COVID, I'm pretty good. <laughs> oh, man. Everybody's getting it these days. Uh, why don't I start? I'm meant to uh, introduce the panelists in the order we agreed on the, the other day for a presentation, starting with Melissa Bondi, Enterprise Community Partner, State and Local Policy Director for the Mid-Atlantic Region. With a portfolio focused on advocacy for housing policy initiatives across the region, Melissa directs coalitions and campaigns and has been very involved <clears throat> with the Purple Line Carter Coalition here in Montgomery County. Trevor Tolbert is a senior vice president at PNC with a local and national focus on affordable debt products, primarily Fannie, Freddie, and HUD. He has over 15 years experience in the affordable housing industry and during that time has closed in excess of a billion dollars of business. Ed Delaney is Senior Director and Senior Vice President and Senior Capital Officer for Capital One. What's in your wallet? Thanks, Community Finance Group, and has been with Cap One since 2010. With 30 years of real estate lending experience, Ed manages debt and equity investments for Capital One's affordable housing community development in Maryland, Virginia, DC, Delaware, Philadelphia, and South Jersey. And AJ Jackson, AJ's here, uh, formerly a partner with EYA, Aiken Young on top, our own. AJ joined JBG Smith as Executive Vice President for Social Impact Investment to lead its Washington Housing Initiative in partnership with the Federal City Council. The initiative is designed to bring private capital to the preservation and production of affordable workforce housing while preventing displacement and strengthening inclusive communities. And of course, our own Hans Reamer has served on the County Council since 2010 and presently chairs the Fed Committee and is on the Transportation and Environment Committee. Prior to joining the Council, he earned his street cred as the National Youth Vote Director for President Obama's 2007 campaign and as political director for Rock the Vote. This is a spectacular panel. Hans is going to be a spectacular moderator, and I yield to you, Hans. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you to the Affordable Housing Conference for bringing us together today. This is one of the, uh, the annual traditions uh, for housing policymakers and, and, and developers and builders and everybody who cares. And I'm glad that we're not losing this tradition this, this, this challenging year. Uh, and I got to say, if, if we're going to recover better, you know, smart housing is going to have to be, housing policy is going to have to be a big part of that. It is one of the few bright spots economically right now. And we want to see housing leading us out of the re recession that we're in. Um, so we need to see more and more production, more jobs, ultimately more housing, more affordability, stronger communities with a higher quality of life. Uh, this is a terrific conversation about uh, creative financing. It, it gets at what I think is happening right now. It is current, it is relevant, and there is tremendous uh, energy and innovation right now. Right now. Uh, and that is about the public and the private sector getting together to figure out new approaches and new ideas. So you're gonna hear from some panelists today that are really at the cutting edge of a, a new kind of thinking uh, for the sector. We have big, big challenges in housing generally. You know, the market is not, taking Montgomery County as an example, the market's not producing the numbers that it used to produce. Our, our annual housing unit production is about half of what it once was. You know, we've shifted from farmland, greenfield, suburban development to smart growth development. But I think it turns out that smart growth development is a lot more challenging and has different economics. And it's, it's we're, 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 we need more of it. <laughs> uh, at the same time, we also know that even if the market were producing more housing, 
would necessarily produce enough affordable housing. You know, market rate housing is often not the more affordable housing. It's older housing. It's market housing that has been set aside, whether through restrictions or MPDU programs and so forth. So what we're going to hear about today is some of the uh, you know, cutting edge ideas about how not only to produce and preserve uh, more housing, but more dedicated affordable housing. At the committee, the county council, we've been working hard on this. Uh, you know, since I took over as chair of the Fed committee, uh, which is a tremendous honor, it's a, it's a position of, of great uh, significance at the county council, and I'm, I'm really privileged to be able to uh, carry that mantle. Uh, we've been working hard on a, I think is a terrific model to support a public-private partnership model through HOC, our Housing Opportunities Commission, our fantastic public housing authority uh, that is teamed up with the private sector and is seeking to get to scale at a level that has never been achieved before. And we have identified a way to create a construction fund that they can borrow from and repay and, and, and ramp up their level of annual production with that certainty um, and then bring in private sector partners to deliver the housing that has the potential to create thousands and thousands of housing units with uh, at least a third set aside for very low income uh, tenants uh, in the coming years. We're working on a plan to promote the preservation and construction of affordable housing in the Purple Line Corridor. Melissa, I'm, Melissa I know we'll talk more about this important priority, but you know, housing in the Purple Line Corridor, this is a critical moment. 15 years from now, if we, don't, if we haven't acted now to preserve and, and promote affordable housing, it's not gonna, it, we, we will have lost a moment in time. So we are working to pull forward long-term commitments into short-term bonded pools of capital that our private and nonprofit sector partners could use to acquire and, and develop housing. And that's another idea we're working on at the council. We've got a plan, a, a tax bill, that will be before the county council next week to provide a payment in lieu of taxes or essentially a, a, a 15 year waiver of property taxes for new development at metro station sites. If you, if you come out of any metro station in Montgomery County, you won't see a, a, a tall building there at the station. Uh, tall buildings or any development on metro station faces enormous legacy costs of moving bus bays and you know, reinforcing the engineering and the station access and as a result of those expenses, literally nothing is happening at, at stations in Montgomery County. Uh, we wanna change that dynamic. We want you to come out of a Metro station and be at the heart of a smart growth community. And we've got a tax bill uh, on, the, on the council agenda for Tuesday that would uh, provide some predict predictability about uh, incentives for that to happen. Um, we are working on pilots for nonprofits to again, provide them with more security for what they want, what they need from the county, at least part of what they need let them have it in their pro forma so they don't have to negotiate as much for it afterwards. And finally, I'd love to see the county providing creative financing for ADUs and other kind of small scale development. Uh, you know, that, that's a terrific opportunity to bring more affordable housing into our neighborhoods. So lots to work on. Uh, I'll turn it back to uh, you, Ralph, to, to call out the order for our panelists. Try it. Ralph, you're on mute, I think. It's not, it's, not, it's not a successful Zoom without somebody talking while they're muted. So thank you, Ralph, you can check that box. For many of us to do that. Melissa, terrific. Take us to the purple line. Hi, friends. Uh, I want to also thank uh, Ralph, you, and the Affordable Housing Conference for this, creating this panel and for inviting Enterprise to participate in it and to all my fellow colleagues. I was only given about three hours to make opening remarks, so uh, I'm going to have to rush through this. But uh, as a practical matter, just wanted to start by saying when we might have thought about doing this panel 10 months ago, it would have looked and felt a lot different than it does today. And it is important, I think, to acknowledge just for a minute how the coronavirus has really impacted our public understanding and also for those of us who work in the sector in a variety of different ways, how we think and value housing as a priority in our communities. Um, people like me who always work on housing are constantly talking about how housing is a solution to a lot of different community priorities. And now we can explicitly add public health to that list of priorities. 
but we can't only work on the triage and kind of the immediate response for what the coronavirus has meant for many low income and vulnerable um, Montgomery County residents, not to mention really everybody in our community. But specifically to also think about what are we doing now that's going to pay dividends for us for years to come. And so I'm really appreciative that we are spending a lot of our time today looking at the big picture of how are we creating, preserving, rehabilitating housing affordability um, through innovation in this panel. A couple of quick things I wanted to say at Enterprise, uh, we are a community development financial institution. We operate in many ways, uh, like a, a bank, but we also have some requirements and also some privileges that come from the federal government in terms of where and how we operate. And Enterprise is one of a, a large network of CDFIs that do outstanding work in Montgomery County and really across our region. As a practical matter, when we are thinking at Enterprise about innovation, especially on the capital side in Montgomery County, we're really looking through two lenses. The first is what are the opportunities for CDFIs to bring their strengths, the things that we can bring uniquely um, to kind of the portfolio of providers uh, to help leverage and strengthen the county's response and the private sector's response to opportunities for preservation rehabilitation and, uh, and new construction. CDFIs are fast acting. Uh, we have tremendous capacity to assess deals, to be able to look at opportunities and proposals and to see what the strength and capacity is of, of partners who wanna to work together on a deal. We offer a lot of flexibility, um, both in our lending rates and kind of some, what we can offer um, as a financing partner. And then we also really have a tremendous amount of experience collectively. I would say the CDFIs that operate in Montgomery County, you know, we also, many of us work across the nation. We've done tens of thousands of deals in every kind of condition and circumstance. So we bring a lot of experience toward innovation. So what we're looking at in terms of proposals that have been brought forward and there's, there's a, a proposal from DHCA on acquisition, there's Council Member Reamer proposals regarding, you know, how might we use financing and innovation. CDFIs are always going to step up and say, how can we help? How can we leverage? How can we bring more and attract more private sector capital to make Montgomery County dollars go further um, and more flexibly to meet priority needs? What are some of those priority needs? Well, we know there's a preservation study um, that's been ongoing that's really helped us to identify where and how preservation might be most uh, impactful and helpful. But specifically um, from my work and many of my colleagues, we've been deeply embedded in Purple Line Corridor review for several years. Um, the Purple Line Corridor is a coalition, is, of course, as most folks on this call know, uh, a major coalition of cross-sector collaborators, and we really focus our energy in a few places, but one of those key places is in housing affordability. We have an action team that is really focused on building a so-called pipeline of projects along the Purple Line, both in Montgomery and Prince George's County. Um, to look at where should we be preserving, where should we be building new construction, where should we be doing rehabilitation or combinations. And in that work, not only are we thinking as a CDFI, how do we leverage and bring more uh, to bear from our resources with any public uh, proposals or public dollars that are available, but we are also looking at philanthropic and private sector capital. So those who might not invest in Montgomery County except for the fact that there is a Purple Line corridor um, that's well organized and strategic and thoughtful and has the full faith and credit of both jurisdictions. In that work, uh, we have been uh, part of a, a group that's been soliciting for and successful in receiving a lot of private sector investment um, between the J.P. Morgan Chase uh, Foundation, Kaiser Permanente, Robert Wood Johnson, K. Fritz, Meyer, um, Federal Transit Authority, uh, you know, millions of dollars have been raised specifically for preservation, new construction and rehabilitation of housing that can serve a mix of incomes, but specifically those that represent the low and moderate needs of, uh, of those residents who are here today so that they're not displaced. So we're really proud of that work. We think we will continue to be able to do more um, philanthropic fundraising, but that will also be leveraged by the work of CDFIs, by 
my fellow panelists and their work, but importantly from the county's commitment to the Purple Line and its commitment to Montgomery County as a whole. That's really what uh, our philanthropic partners want to make sure is happening so that they know that they're working in the, under the long haul with lots of partners. I'm happy to talk about that in more detail, but I uh, just wanted to say those are the things that we bring to the table for this conversation today. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Trevor? Hey, Ralph. Thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, thank you, everybody out there for joining us today. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of ways you could spend your Friday afternoon, so appreciate you uh, sitting with us. Um, my presentation will be short and sweet, honestly, actually. Um, you know, uh, one of the better things in the, the economy right now is, is our debt lending. Uh, as everyone knows, rates have dropped dramatically, even in the last three, four months. Um, every week on our pipeline calls or our, our, our weekly updates, I hear record lows. I know we've heard this for the last 10, 12 years, but uh, it truly is kind of the most aggressive time to be refinancing or financing new projects. Um, as, as Ralph mentioned, I typically focus on uh, the debt product here at PNC. Uh, while we do offer you know, equity, we offer our, our balance sheet, all sorts of different financing options. I primarily focus on Fannie, Freddie, and HUD. Um, so I figured I'd hit the highlights, give everyone, you know, kind of the information that they are hoping to hear, especially rate wise. Um, you know, first I thought I would touch off on HUD. Um, myself, I uh, originally was a MAP underwriter, so I do have a MAP license via HUD. So I do a lot of specifically HUD business. Um, you know, as of, I guess, last week, we locked a deal at 223F, affordable deal at 207. Uh, that's a 35 year fully amortizing transaction. The week before it was 212. So uh, as you can see, they do keep decreasing. I cannot imagine that they're going to go much lower than they are here uh, today. But, um, you know, it's very good news for borrowers. Um, even four or five months ago, we were processing at, a, you know, two and a half percent on those rates. Um, and that, again, is for, for a refi or a purchase of a project. Um, on a 221D4, which is HUD's construction perm loan in one, uh, we're around 275 today. Uh, you do have to add MIP to these products, but that's a 40-year fully amortizing product. So it is uh, a long time that you, you can have that loan locked in like that for. Um, and that's, again, a construction and permit one. So, you know, you have your construction period and then you have a 40-year fully amortizing transaction once you are stabilized. A um, few other highlights for HUD. Um, they actually recently uh, removed their three-year rule. Uh, they previously had a, a no refinance through the 223F program. Uh, rule for three years after CFO. It is now 30 days at stabilized occupancy, roughly nine, 90%. Um, that allows builders to, you know, developers to build without um, a HUD loan, meaning they don't necessarily have to use Davis-Bacon wages, which uh, oftentimes, especially in this area, can be very costly. So um, that way you can refi right out of your construction loan into a perm HUD loan. Uh, and again, that's that 35-year product. Uh, Timing-wise, HUD, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to get better. They truly are. Um, we are process, processing refis purchases uh, in about five to six months. Uh, they do have a pilot program for uh, deeply affordable transactions uh, for construction that we can get done in six months. Your typical affordable deal on the construction timing would be eight to nine months to close. Um, and that's, again, if everything's ready to roll, due diligence items, uh, drawings, things like that. Um, we recently completed a transaction in Rockville with the Rockville Housing Authority. Uh, it was a $65 million total uh, slug of equity, debt, all combined. Um, the, the, the HUD piece, I'm sorry, it was $61 million. The HUD piece was $35 million. Uh, PNC provided both the debt and equity in that transaction. Um, that's one of the nice things, and not to do an advertisement for PNC, but uh, one of the nice things about PNC is we, you know, we do provide both debt, equity, our uh, equity shop. Um, you know, also uh, is a syndication shop and we have direct CRA needs. So that's, uh, again, uh, it's, it's sometimes nice to limit the brain damage that you, that you may uh, have on some of these transactions by working with one group. Um, next, I'll touch on Fannie Mae. Uh, the, the agencies, along with HUD, um, are setting records this year. Um, I believe the Fannie Productions are already at a level where it was or near the level uh, where it was last year. And they're continuing to push. Um, Timing-wise, it's getting pushed out. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing to think there's three months left in the year. Um, and if I'm not working on a deal, it's not going to close this year if we're not already engaged in processing, unfortunately. Um, they're inundated with deals. Um, just everyone's timing, including PNC's, honestly, um, has really been uh, expanded out. You know, these deals were quite in 45 days in the past. 
Now they're taking 90 days um, just to be you know, realistic. But rates are great there too. Recently did a refi at 217. Um, Fannie and Freddie, it's really based on uh, kind of the product type that we're using. So rates can range from, I have a deal out there at 415, um, a Freddie forward right now. And then like I just mentioned, we did a refi at 217. So uh, there is a pretty wide range there. Um, we are seeing a lot of the forward products. So for Fannie, that would be the MTEP and for Freddie, that'd be the TEL. Um, these are our forward commitments for construction loans on the affordable side. Um, you know, I've seen them go out as long as 36 months from, uh, for construction. And then basically once you stabilize there, they, they put in their locked rate and close the loan. Um, I am working currently on a deal in Loudoun County uh, with a local developer out of Rockville as well. Um, they chose the Fannie MTEP to work with on, on the deal and they chose to go 35 year fully amortizing loan. Uh, the rate on this is 365, which is a pretty incredible rate right now, um, especially for a forward commitment of uh, 24 plus months, uh, which, is, which is good to see. Um, they're very active, um, you know, Fannie and Freddie are very active in this market specifically. Um, you know, they're both pretty much headquartered here. So um, they're, they're very aggressive on, on the pricing and what they can do for deals. Um, from the Freddie side, uh, Freddie typically has been better on hybrid transactions. So that's uh, where the, where there's a four and nine combined. Um, and then any 9% transaction, Freddie's more aggressive on. So that's where we're seeing 9% business to go to, to go to Freddie and then the 4% uh, business is kind of split between the two. Um, Freddie offer, also offers a, a, a non litech affordable forward, uh, which I'm doing one in Omaha right now. Um, that can be very aggressive. Uh, the, the, you know, they're up to uh, basically 10 year AM or 10 year term, 30 year AM. Um, on the other products, the truly affordable deals with LIHTC credits involved, they can go up to a four year amortization. So there is a, you know, just a, a lot of products out there. And, and it's kind of what we do when I look at a deal, I look at all three options or all, whatever options. And then, uh, you know, we move forward from there and just pick whichever one's the best. Um, you know, out of the three, HUD, HUD is typically the best, best loan, best proceeds, best rate, but worst timing. So there's a lot of headache that goes into them. Um, and, and they all kind of have, uh, you know, a lot of the same requirements, you know, COVID specifically. Um, they all have reserve requirements for those, uh, for, for COVID. We've had a lot of success on affordable deals specifically um, to either get that waiver really short and drastically, um, which has been, which has, you know, been very uh, helpful for for the borrowers uh, with a low rates, but a higher reserve, you don't always see the benefit. Um, what else do we have? Uh, PNC in general, I might as well touch on it while we're here. Um, our live tech group, uh, and, and I know Ed will talk about this in more depth, but uh, you know, pricing has, has dropped pretty drastically. Uh, we quoted a deal just before COVID, so February at 90 cents. Um, the borrower's investor actually fell out, so they wanted us to requote it three months later, and we were at 82 cents. So, um, you know, pricing, you know, it is what it is, um, just because there's less demand for the credits at this point. Um, that being said, you know, we have performed on everything that we've put an LOI on. Um, you know, we're not always most aggressive, but we do try to make sure that we perform on anything that we've promised. Um, and then we also have a community development group that's local to each market. So there's one locally here. Um, I actually sit in DC when we do have offices uh, with, our, with our group there. And, um, you know, they, they provide lending, kind of gap filling lending loans. Um, they can go up to 20 million, uh, typically from two to 20 million, usually construction, but they can also do refis. Um, so they're, they're a very good option. Uh, one of the advantages of being a big bank is you have a lot of these options to, uh, to perform on. Um, besides that, that's kind of a brief overview of what we're seeing in the market at this point. Um, honestly, you know, from, from my end, unlike most ends, uh, life is Good. We're very busy, and we're you know we're seeing low rates and great proceeds. Uh, so I'll turn it back over to you, Ralph. Thank you, Trevor. Of course. Uh, Ralph, should I take it from here? Uh, sure. Okay, we're going to go to Ed. I think Ed, Ed is next. Ed Delaney. Mute. Unmute. Testing. We hear you. No. How about now? There you go. 
Yeah, I dialed, on, dialed in with my phone, but uh, apparently didn't connect. Sorry. Um, so as uh, thank you all for having me here today. Um, as uh, Ralph mentioned, I manage the debt and equity investments for Capital One's community finance in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, I, that means uh, as far as the debt, I do the same products Trevor does. Uh, we'll do balance sheet lending, um, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA. And uh, I also do the like, low income housing and historic tax credit investments in my same book. So um, I, I grew up in Montgomery County with much of my family still living here. And I've seen really big changes in the county over the years. And housing affordability has become a central issue for the county. Um, it's amazing to me. Many years ago, my mother sold her home um, that my parents paid $20,000 for, and she sold it for $500,000 and moved into a home in uh, Leisure World in off Georgia Avenue. And she probably paid $400,000 for a little uh, duplex. So she was fortunate uh, that she had uh, the ability to do that, but so many people in this county don't. Um, so one of the uh, passions I have is not only affordable housing in Montgomery County, but it's also for seniors. And in 2016, Capital One was able to work with uh, Maryland, DHCD, Montgomery County, HOC, and DHCA to close on the first Freddie Mac Tell tax exempt loan. Um, Trevor told you about those in Maryland. Um, that program had much more flexibility than the other bond credit enhancement products then being currently employed in the state, specifically with respect to the senior household composition. Um, FHA typically requires that uh, either in a 231, all the members of the household are 60, uh, 62 or over, or um, the 221D4, at least one member had to be um, 62 or over, and the other had to be a spouse or a and the county was very desirous of having the ability to have the option for a grand family there where a grandparent could take care of uh, a grandchild. And that just didn't work with FHA. So we were able to get the, uh, the tell done. And as a result, 105 units of housing was developed in Silver Spring with 95 of those units affordable to persons, uh, households uh, earning between 40 and 60. And there were also 10 units that were unrestricted as to income. Since then, We've closed on three other TEL transactions in the county as either the lender, uh, the equity investor, or both. And in fact, we had a virtual ribbon cutting yesterday for Victor Victory Housing's Victory Haven development in Damascus, Maryland. And we expect to convert uh, the momentum at Shady Grove, a transit-oriented development next week. So those two developments in particular at opposite ends of the spectrum in Montgomery County, Damascus is uh, an interesting area where it's it's still rural, but there's a lot of gentrification. And what we found was there was not a lot of options for affordable housing, senior affordable housing there. And we have uh, residents there between 30% and unrestricted, 30% um, AMI. Uh, whereas the uh, momentum at Shady Grove is right there at the Metro. And, um, you know, different challenges for each of these transactions with the, being able to bring them home. Um, so, a lot of innovative structures are being employed as a variant of this product to eliminate um, substantial user and program investment rules, which make it difficult for the same entity to be both lender and investor in the same deal. Um, and these include a combination of cash collateralized short-term bonds with the Freddie Mac Tell structure. And um, the other product I was gonna talk about, but Trevor did, is the, the Fannie Mae M tabs, which uh, employs taxable loans for the investor side, which eliminates that program investor rule, and with tax exempt funding. And uh, since Trevor talked about it, the 9-4 twinning, um, we, we've been doing those as well. And we're doing, um, uh, we, we had started doing those in Virginia, probably close six or seven twinning deals in Virginia, but we have two going right now, one in Montgomery County, that one will be done as uh, Freddie Mac, and primarily because they want, uh, among other things, to avoid the additional cost of uh, Davis-Bacon wages. And then one we're gonna do in Baltimore, we will do that one as a, um, with two uh, FHA 221D4 loans. So um, there's a lot of ways to do it and the state has been um, inching into more innovative structures to help make these things work. Um, whereas 
when I first started doing deals in the state, there was really only two ways to do it, FHA credit enhanced bond or FHA risk share. And while those still work, they are not one size fits all. So the ability to work with the county and the state to come together uh, and make these other uh, structures work is, uh, has been very uh, instrumental in making affordable housing continue to happen, especially in Montgomery County, the highest income county in the country. Um, however, I think the need for innovation will continue and is growing as we're currently seeing two immediate effects of the pandemic. Trevor mentioned one of them, much lower equity pricing. Um, you know, just this time last year, um, pricing had been creeping back up and you were seeing uh, transactions with, you know, lower tier pricing in the high 90s. Um, now, it's not unusual to see it in the 80s. Um, 10 cents on a, you know, $20 million deal can mean a million dollars of less equity in it. And that is coming at the same time where the pandemic is putting big stress on the state and local resources that are intended to fill the gaps. You know, the state of Maryland has its RHW rental housing works program, which is a gap filler on 4% deals. Um, that money that was funded for this year was fully funded for the ask that the uh, groups like the Maryland Affordable Housing Coalition have put forth, but who knows where it'll be next year. Uh, Montgomery County typically is a very big participant, both the county and HOC, in putting in grants or soft money to make these very expensive transactions work. And, you know, the budgets are being stressed. We don't know where that money is going to come from next year. So we all have to continue to work hard and try to find new ways to make financing work in, uh, in a county where the need is, is only growing. Um, one of the other things I learned on, um, on the ribbon cutting yesterday, I think said currently um, one in five um, seniors in um, Montgomery County are, are very housing uh, disadvantaged, but we could have as many as one in three households in the next several years will be 55 and older. So those are the residents who are most income constrained and helping to find a way to keep them living in the neighborhoods where they grew up and they raised their children and their grandchildren is I think a critical need for the county. I'll turn it back to Ralph who just left the picture. Thank I'll you. Turn it back to Hans. Thank you. Uh, exactly. Uh, as the baby boom it, you know, is aging as, as people are looking to downsize, they've got to have a place to go. Um, and that, that really relates to the underlying challenge of creating enough new housing as well. You know, these things all fit together. Uh, before I turn it to AJ, I want us to invite anyone watching. We have a really nice uh, group of participants on the, watching the panel. Uh, please post a question uh, to the Q and A. Um, and I will, I will, uh, Ralph and I will be working together to, uh, present your questions to the panelists. So don't be shy. Um, and uh, now I'd like to turn it to AJ Jackson, who is uh, also at the, the leading edge of one of the products I'm watching with, with great interest in the region. Uh, it's just really exciting. So AJ. Thank you. Thanks, Hans. And, and thanks, everyone, for, uh, for tuning in uh, today. Um, uh, as they said, I'm AJ Jackson with, with JBG Smith, and we're um, a, a non-traditional player in, the, in this space. We're the, the largest you know, non-governmental owner and operator of real estate across the region, and that's both multifamily as well as commercial and, and retail, a little over $6 billion in assets that we, that, that we own. Um, and that gives us a view as to sort of what's been going on with housing and housing affordability in this area for a while. And to a point that Melissa made earlier, uh, we decided a couple of years ago really to try to leverage our skills as a real estate operator and a capital allocator to see if we can have a positive impact on trying to address housing affordability in the region. And where we have focused in is on the issue of preservation. I know Melissa talked a little bit about this, but most of the affordable housing um, in our region and really in every region is, is naturally occurring affordable housing. It's NOAA housing. And that's particularly true for those in the middle who may earn too much to qualify for subsidized housing like low-income housing, tax credit housing, or project-based Section 8 housing, but who are still 
constrain, you know, and, and in our region that that really means, you know, people earning anywhere from 40 or $50,000 a year up to up to almost $100,000 a year. Those naturally occurring affordable housing units are being lost at a rapid clip. More than 30,000 of them are traded every year. And most of those don't go in any form of preservation or affordability protection because there hasn't been capital or programs um, uh, to do that. We also saw that buying existing housing is faster and less expensive than building new housing, although we do need to build more housing. I want to be, be clear about that. That's Preservation is an essential part of housing affordability, but it is not the entire solution. We have to increase the supply of housing, particularly at, for, for low-income people uh, in this, uh, not just in the county, but across the, for the, Washington, the Washington region. Um, but that, that existing housing is faster, less expensive to purchase. It's also, much of it is very well located, and there's less opportunity for um, for NIMBYism to block affordability, candidly, in existing housing. And so the, we, we saw that and created the Washington Housing Initiative. This moment of, of, of COVID, um, I think, is actually creating an increased need, but also an increased opportunity around uh, preservation. Because affordable housing, and many of you know this, is really more impacted by the recession over the long run than the virus. And not to say that residents of affordable housing are not tremendously at risk, many of them are essential workers. That's not what I'm saying. What I mean when I say that is that in the class A market, most of the impacts that we have in housing are due to the constraints that we've imposed to control the pandemic, right? So people working remotely choose to leave the region temporarily, but will come back to their office when their office reopens. Students don't take apartments because universities are virtual. Empty nesters go to the Eastern Shore instead of going to downtown Bethesda because they can't go to the restaurants and retail that they wanted to. Those things change when the pandemic uh, eases and when stores reopen. The economic impacts on moderate income and low income people are more severe and longer lasting. And that's why I say that for the affordable housing space, it's really the economic story is, is a bigger story than the, than the virus, even though the virus is a very significant story. Um, but that I think will create some opportunities for patient capital uh, to acquire units and impose affordability and do more preservation um, in, the, in the next few, few years here. To do preservation, you need capital that can move with speed, capital that can move at scale, capital that's willing to invest for the long term, and capital that really is willing to accept returns that are in line, I would argue, with the risk and stability of affordable housing and not opportunistic and not, not opportunistic terms. And so we raised a pool of money uh, from investors of a little over $100 million that we're deploying to help nonprofits and others acquire and preserve naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, the idea here is to put out institutional capital at scale to leverage philanthropy and or government resources with as much private capital as possible and to allow this model to then be replicated both in the county around the region and in, and in, other, um, in other places. So we're excited about, um, about what we see as, as potential to do real preservation in the, in the county. Um, we're working with some sponsors right now on opportunities here. We, um, and we, we closed an opportunity earlier this year in Northern Virginia, um, where we were able to go in and buy a building. We, we helped a local nonprofit put a building under contract on the, three, in the 395 corridor just before Halloween. We closed on that acquisition right around Martin Luther King Day. That acquisition put 326 units of uh, existing housing into the ownership of a local nonprofit, and in the process, created 245 units of committed affordable housing. Uh, as it was mentioned, I was a developer at UIA before I started doing this. A lot of you have been in this space a long time. I'm still, my head is still spinning that we created 245 units of committed affordable housing in 90 days. And that's the power of preservation. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll leave it there and we'll have a good discussion up for you. Super, great. Um, well, let me uh, sort of kick off the, the panel's discussion here. We've got 20 minutes and uh, plenty of time for uh, dialogue. And I'll certainly encourage our panelists to also direct questions or, or comments to one another and, and we can kind of have a round table format. But um, great presentations, uh, really appreciate what everyone is doing. Um, maybe I could just kick it off by asking if there were some policy issues that you think would uh, smooth the path for the kind of work that you're doing, um, you know, thinking big or thinking small. What what are some of the things that Montgomery County needs to needs to know about or needs to address in order to 
uh, ensure that the mission that you're involved in uh, could be more successful here. Um, so I'll, I'll throw it open, maybe reverse order. Uh, AJ, uh, ask, ask if you could start us. Sure. Uh, I think the legislation that, that you're working on, frankly, that you mentioned earlier, to provide predictable tax abatement to nonprofit owners um, is, is critical. The, the tax abatement is one of the most powerful tools for preservation. Um, and that's because tax abatements increase NOI, which allows us to bring more private capital through leverage, obviously, from, from folks like Ed and Trevor and others to the, to the table. The issue with preservation versus new development is that preservation happens at the speed of the market. And so being able to underwrite that abatement with certainty, knowing what it is, what, what counts, what doesn't count, how big it will be, how long it will last, what we need to do to achieve it, and take that to the lender in real time so that when we're in a competitive process with other, with other bidders, but, you know, opportunistic buyers, luxury housing buyers, for, for an asset, we can understand what our capital stack is and know if we can, if we can be competitive. And so that, um, you know, I think that's one of the single greatest tools uh, to help to help preservation, um, pr particularly um, when you're talking about trying to buy, you know, NOAA properties in the market. Thank you. I'll just uh, I'll state for the audience, uh, you know, in case it isn't clear. Typically, nonprofits will negotiate a one-off deal with the county to provide for an abatement of property taxes over, you know, usually indefinitely. Uh, but that's been the, that's been the past. But it has to be negotiated uh, on a one-off basis. Um, and I am working on legislation uh, with Council Member Friedson as well that would create certainty and just say, this is an entitlement. It provided you attain a certain affordability levels, you will automatically be provided that abatement. And then as AJ said, you know, the hope is that that will enable nonprofits uh, or mission-driven housing providers to be much more nimble in the marketplace and, and have more of their stack certain before they begin and enable them to be more aggressive, trying to be set a context for success from the kinds of work that we hear about here today. Uh, terrific, I'll continue through the panelists if, if others would like to respond to that question. Sure, um, I agree with AJ, tax, um, tax abatement is, is critical. Obviously, if you're going to, and both for preservation and new construction, it costs about the same to build a 150 unit affordable project as a 150 unit market rate project, but you have less income because you have restricted your rents. So if we can reduce the expense of the real estate tax very predictably, that's gonna allow us to drive more debt uh, and will help compensate for lower equity pricing and some of the other loss of the gaps. I would say the, the second thing, and I hear this from uh, developers all the time, our transactions can take, you know, four years, five years from inception till when we finally close. And going through entitlements, uh, zoning and everything else that is necessary to be able to just get to the point where we can close um, can be a very, very long journey. And with the um, developers first trying to, having to compete, uh, the affordable housing developers having to compete with market rate developers for the same piece of land, many of them are faced with having to try to go ahead and buy that land now because they don't have patient sellers who are willing to wait three to four years to get paid. That puts additional strain on their resources. And it seems to me that I've heard over the years from the county that um, affordable housing is a priority. Well, maybe there could be some way to expedite the entitlement process from soup to nuts, zoning, permits, everything for, uh, for something that is a stated priority to the county. There, maybe there can be a, uh, an express lane for affordable housing developers to get through the process. I'm not saying they skip a step, but they don't have to wait in line with, you know, hundreds of other people to try to get to the point where they can finally, you know, we can go to the, the, the groundbreaking. Thank you. That is a very interesting suggestion. Uh, and uh, I will, I'm noting that. Um, I just want to say, I'm, I'm told that the chat function has been disabled. Uh, Ralph, I don't know if you can. Uh, That's true. You go to the Q and A. Okay. Um, go to the Q and A if you want to lodge a question for the panel. Please go to the Q and A. Okay, continue. I'll piggyback on where uh, Ed was going with that. You know, as far as timing or, or you know, going to the head of line, HUD actually does that already as well. Uh, their typical market rate uh, transaction actually is a two phase or two submission process. 
whereas uh, a affordable deal can just do a single submission. So that cuts off months. Um, yeah, obviously, it's not, not the same as getting entitlements or zoning, but um, you know, other agencies are doing things similar to that. So that might be a good way, you know, good track to follow maybe. Um, and then with, uh, you know, as, as AJ talked about the abatements, I think a, a key thing would be to not only make it part of the legislation, um, you know, where it's just, if you check these boxes, you're good to go, um, is to remember timing as well, as far as how long it'll last. Um, you know, on a lot of our transactions that we work on, um, if it is not for the term of the loan, and some of these are, again, are 40 year terms, um, we have to underwrite it separately. So there's a AB or a piece and a B piece. And sometimes that can hurt uh, the borrower's proceeds on the deals. Um, I did a deal recently in Long Island and they had 12 years remaining on the pilot. We couldn't get it extended. So, you know, they took a haircut on the deal pretty drastically. Um, luckily it was a refi and they were cashing out. So it was just, you know, uh, it wasn't as much of a problem. They didn't not, they weren't not able to build. But, uh, you know, if you're thinking about the leg legislation on this, it may make sense to, you know, the longer the abatement can go, the better it is from the lending side. Yeah, I'd like to just piggyback on that before you go back. I worked in another county recently where they had an abatement, but the county built in that in the event uh, after so many years, the debt service coverage on that transaction exceeded 120, the county had the right to pull back the abatement. Well, that made it unworkable. You know, nobody was going to underwrite it um, because we'd say, we don't know how long we can keep that. Um, the abatement should be there to make this work and not be a little landmine that uh, if the property happens to be successful, you'll pull it away. So you know, making it for the term of the loan and, and making it certain. Um, we've also seen in other, other areas where we had them step down over time. So you might have a full abatement for five years or 10 years and then it starts to step down. Well, the, the, the idea behind that is, oh, the properties are going to get improved in value and they'll be able to handle that. Unfortunately, these affordable properties, especially the ones where we have very deeply low skewed rents of 30%, 40% AMI, those properties don't increase in NOI over a rapid amount. In fact, when we have very low rents, they have a negatively trending NOI. So we really need the certainty of a long-term tax abatement. And uh, another thing too, I've worked on a deal with uh, annual renewals. Um, we couldn't even underwrite the, the abatement at all because it's annual renewal. It could change next year. There's no guarantee that they're going to get it. So uh, this small nonprofit in Terrell, Texas, we weren't able to use their, their abatement that they're receiving, even though it's part, part of the legislation and they were, you know, a Chodo, everything checked all the boxes, but uh, we weren't able to get any credit for it. Sounds like a ringing endorsement for the legislation. Melissa. Uh, on the system side, through the Purple Line, uh, the Housing Accelerator Action Team has a goal of actually creating what we call kind of colloquially a SWAT team. And it would take not only some of the good suggestions that have been raised on the policy side, right, on the, on the what, what incentives can we offer, but also saying, can we convene bankers, brokers, pro those who are interested in doing deals, uh, those on the development side, um, to identify together with local government where are opportunities? Where are areas of either high interest or high potential? What might be coming online, either for sale or, or for redevelopment potential from the private sector? And then what, what capital can be brought to bear that can be poised and ready to go um, you know, on a short turnaround where but a deal that would work for Ed may not be exactly the same kind of deal that would work for Trevor, but as a practical matter, if we're in conversation together and PNC is saying, this is the amount of capital that we could have ready to go for a deal that met these specs. And then six CDFIs are saying, here's what we could bring to bear in terms of, of additional leverage and, and financing. And the county were to say, this is the amount of capital that we've got ready to go and we can pull a trigger on that so that we're being more proactive than reactive to the market. Um, to AJ's original point, we think that that kind of approach, it doesn't mean that everybody has to be involved in everybody else's deal, but it really lets everybody on, be on the same page with the partners who are trying to see the whole quarter at once and say, hey, we got a 120 unit senior deal. I'm gonna call Ed, we've got a 200 unit preservation deal that nobody thought was gonna be on the market until it was. I wonder if, if AJ is interested in that or what have you. And then all of the partners, including philanthropy, might be assembled together and ready to take that phone call and say, yeah, our 1.2 million's in. Yeah, our term sheet's in. Yeah, we're ready to go. And we think that that, that kind of crowdsourcing approach 
uh, might actually be helpful in being more uh, responsive in a fast way. I just wanted to offer that in addition That's to perfect. all the technical stuff folks have mentioned. I think that's a really exciting idea, Melissa, because there's need up and down the spectrum. And you talked about committed senior versus family units versus what, and there, and we're all serving different pieces of, of, of need. And if there could be a way to, you know, to quickly, a supermarket of finance, essentially, if we yeah. could, could quickly yep. close these things, that would really, I think, be a, a benefit to everyone. We've had some great analogies out of I've got supermarket, I've heard SWAT team, I've heard pipeline, I've heard uh, speed dating, lots of good things. So we're, we're open. So now all together. Uh, great questions. Um, okay, one question for, I'll start uh, directing this to AJ and others may comment. Uh, from Jeffrey Rubin, please elaborate what it means for investors to accept a return on investment consistent with the risk in the context of preservation housing. Okay, so in, our, in the case of the Washington Housing Initiative and in our investment vehicle, which we call the Impact Pool, our investors are targeting uh, essentially low single digit returns, 7% um, net returns. Traditionally, private equity investors in this sort of class B, class C housing would be looking at some sort of value add uh, and looking for a mid to high teens return, so 12 to 20% return, somewhere in, in that range. Our view is that um, given the huge supply demand imbalance, the reason we're all here uh, in this in this market around housing affordability, given that our, um, our, our mandate and our mission is to provide housing for the long term at rents that are less than could be obtained by those same renters in the in the market, that there's actually a much different and given that uh, affordable housing residents tend to stay much longer in their um, in their property so there's less turnover there's actually a much different risk profile to this type of investment and that low single digit return is more appropriate to the risk uh, and on a risk adjusted basis it is market if, if you will and that's that's important because in order to bring institutional money at scale you've got to make returns on, on that money and you've got to make returns that the investors believe are uh, consistent with the risk that you're asking them uh, that you're asking them to take and consistent with the, with that risk weight against the other alternatives that, that, that they have um, and so we, we don't you know position ourselves as concessionary but what we're saying is the return is lower in absolute terms but on a risk adjusted basis it is actually um, very attractive um, you know much in the way a bond and a stock are, are, are two different things Excellent. All right. The next question, uh, I think, is a little bit of a Rorschach test. Uh, it's coming from Mayor Bridget Donald Newton of Rockville. Uh, how do we preserve the existing garden apartments which offer affordable and accessible housing along with balconies in most cases and outside green space? We need all kinds of housing and tearing these down to build high rise complicates the need for outside space, which we've learned through COVID is critical. Uh, who would like to take a stab at that? Um, you know, something I was actually thinking about, density, uh, you were talking earlier, Hans, about um, how to build around metro stations. Um, you know, the housing affordability crisis is really a housing demand crisis. There's just not enough housing. I mean, we've seen it in areas like Seattle and Portland, where an apartment that might have rented for $600 a month 10 years ago is renting for $2,000 a month with no upgrade at all. It's just that there are people there who can afford it and so others can't. So I think the way to preserve across all these spectrums is to provide options for new housing uh, that doesn't put pressure on redeveloping that housing. And if you have the ability at transit oriented areas to provide additional density to developers, um, I mean, Tyson's Corner is doing that. If you look around every Metro station on the Silver Line, be in Tyson's Corner and all the way out to Reston, mega, I shouldn't use that word, large multi, high rise multifamily buildings are being built. And if you provide that additional density, uh, you can do two things. You can take some of the pressure off those uh, folks who would try to acquire and redevelop those garden apartments, which provide a, a wonderful quality of life for those who want to live there, and then provide with additional density, you can also help incent the other thing that we were talking about, um, or this group was talking as we prepared for this call, how do, you, how do you help the missing middle, 
right now, a lot of people talk about workforce housing, but there's no product ne uh, that exists to uh, fund those who make between 80 and 120% of area median income. Those who make more than that can afford the new stuff. Those who make less than that can work in the tax credit. So if you can provide additional density in those transit oriented areas, developers can build more units and then they can span a much greater uh, array of incomes and then they can provide some true mixed income that can be beneficial. And once again, by doing that, you're creating just more housing overall and that helps with the affordability everywhere. In other words, supporting the construction of new housing on properties that may not be existing market affordable means that there's less demand to take those existing market affordable properties and redevelop them. So exactly. you got to be a YIMBY uh, in order to preserve a f existing market affordable, uh, you know, if you if you just think you can hold the line and, and stop the development, you're really it's a it's a losing battle. You're, you know, you're not going to win that. Ultimately, those properties are going to get turned over. We have a great example of that actually just outside the city of Rockville. That's the a Halpine View complex. Uh, last year, the county council. Uh, through the committee that I chair, we rezoned that property. It's a significant complex, 15, 16 uh, garden style buildings. We rezoned it with an agreement with the property owners that any future development, it would be no net loss of affordable housing. It's entirely market affordable now, but there's zero you know, uh, regulations or, or any type of protection on that affordability. And they could only redevelop, it, re redevelop if they put just as many units into a future affordable programs as exist now. And so we would get triple the amount of housing and the same amount of dedicated preserved affordable housing and probably housing that is more market affordable to be honest, given the location. So there are creative ways you can tackle it uh, if, you, if you're if you willing to uh, actually support housing uh, and help make it happen. Um, any more comments on, on this interesting question? All right. Um, One question is when will the recording become available? I might direct that to Ralph. I'll do that. All right. Answer is next week, early next week. All right. Um, there's a question I wanted to just sort of take the first half about, uh, it, a little mention has been made, but many properties are distressed. This is from Gerald Poach. Uh, many properties are distressed by COVID economic impact. Uh, I know you've mentioned that in different ways, but can you can you just drill down a little bit? What are you looking at, at, at from the affordability perspective? What should we be concerned about? And what are you looking at? What do you see in the next couple of years? How is this going to change your business practice or your your strategy? Maybe we'll start with Trevor. Sure. Um, you know, from from our end. Um, Honestly, a lot of my developer clients are, uh, are are doing okay right now. You know, the 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 stimulus package helped people pay the you know pay their rents. Um, but a lot of the affordable properties, and I deal with a lot of properties that have Section Eight on them as well. Well, um, you know, they're still getting their payments. They've seen one, two, maybe three percent decrease in collections. But typically, they're okay. We're seeing a lot of problems in the B class. You know, that that workforce housing. Uh, people who were making enough money to pay the rent and aren't now, and they're not getting any subsidies. They're 80% AMI. Um, you know, the class A, those guys are fine. You know, people are, you know, like a lot of us, right? They're still just working from home, collecting their paycheck. Um, the, you know, the C and below class, um, they're okay too, because they were getting stimulus help, which now there's some concerns with collections, you know, August, September. Uh, it will be interesting to see how those, those went. But um, you know, it's that workforce housing that we're really seeing a lot of issues with. Um, I think it's a great time to be in affordable housing. There's more demand or need for it than ever. So there's gonna be a lot of growth here. Um, from our business practices, you know, I, I do do some market rate housing as well. And we're transitioning to more affordable. You know, PNC as a whole has more and more focus on affordable housing and providing uh, you know, assistance in, in, in helping with that. Any other comments about what you're looking at as far as distressed properties over the, the coming years? Well, in addition to looking at our um, developers' portfolios, looking at how they're doing, as we're getting ready to do a new transaction, we do want to see where they are. And um, I agree with Trevor. Up until last month, most of them were doing okay. We're starting to see a little bit of weakness. Um, and it, it really varies depending upon uh, their you know, the, the demographic of their individual um, developments. In fact, among 
among our uh, across the spectrum some of our developers have properties that are all over the area and some of them are much more um, susceptible than others in their own portfolio and in, in so, whereas 100 percent section 8 property is probably going to go along with no blips seniors properties they, they typically don't work uh, outside the home they're living on retirement so they're not really changing but where we're also looking is what how are we changing our practices for the development itself what are the uh, protocols that are put in place by the general contractor for working around um, other other subcontractors, how many people can be on the site at the same time? How long is it going to take? Will it bring any, uh, any delay, any impact on um, getting materials? We've seen big delays on getting cabinets, things coming out of uh, China, things coming out of Pennsylvania were all hung up for a while. Um, so we, we build in more time. And by building in more time, we build in more cost. And we really look at everything from multiple ways. Uh, we used to think we we we're very forensic in our underwriting. Now we are doubly so because we're, uh, we just want to make sure that, okay, can we get it built? Can we get it built in this timetable? Once we get it built, how is the developer going to do the leasing? Are they set up to do virtual leasing? Um, and in fact, one of the things that's uh, been a concern in some counties are better than others. Can we get virtual inspections? I mean, we have to have an inspector come out every month. You know, are they doing them virtually? Um, so everything takes more time. And we have to build that in. And is anything that takes more time costs more money because your interest clock is ticking. And our projections for, you know, what uh, things will be, in fact, what what rents may be payable in two years from now may be lower than what they are today. So these are all the things we look at. I, I should add, and it's probably the topic of another panel, but the county's put about thirty million dollars, I think, towards rental assistance, which is intended to help stabilize some of those properties. Uh, you know, through uh, a payment that will go to the landlord, but is uh, there's some agreement with the with the tenant um, about you know how it how it can be counted. So, uh, Ralph, I hate to do this. Uh, what I see is a syllabus for a graduate degree in affordable housing played out by U5. They've just been fabulous, really excellent panel. <clears throat> I uh, have a few closing comments, which are basically thanks to all of our visitors for coming. Recordings, as I said, will be available early next week, we're told. Uh, and we, of course, appreciate our sponsors who have uh, made this whole event possible. So again, thanks to panelists, thanks to visitors uh, and participants. We'll try to deal with the questions. There's some really good questions. Nobody touched the mobile home question. And by the way, the conversion of office space into housing is uh, seems like an obvious impact of COVID. In any case, we look forward to next May. <clears throat> Watch for announcements for a real in-person event next May. Uh, this is a difficult time. We'll be glad when it's over for a whole lot of reasons. And thank you all for participating. <clears throat> and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank Welcome. you, Ralph. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you. Great panel. Bye-bye.